Welcome to PCR London Valves 2023. I am Antoinette Nealon and I have the delight to be joined today by Didier Cheche from Toulouse and Oli de Bakker from Copenhagen in Denmark. Um, and we're going to have a talk today about lifetime management in TAVI and what evidence we have in terms of directing lifetime management in TAVI. So I guess first we need to know uh, Didier, this is to you. What are the key issues in terms of lifetime management for TAVI? So it's, um, you're right, Antoinette. This is a burning issue, burning question. How do we integrate the life expectancy of the patient when it comes to selecting the proper device? So we do have uh, some uh, outcomes to, uh, to keep in mind. And I, I do believe that the younger the patient is, the best the outcome has to be in terms of getting no paravalvular regurgitation, a very nice hemodynamics. And to my opinion, this is a very crucial part of the management of the younger patients, uh, decreasing the pacemaker rate, Ole, yep. and making sure that there is no stroke at the end, at the end X procedure, and that's very important. So selecting the best platform according to the patient anatomy for the best clinical outcomes at the index procedure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think also I fully agree on that. So that's optimizing really your procedural outcome also in the short and intermediate. And on the long term, actually, I think you also want to really uh, preserve the coronary accessibility. Exactly. I think that's also really important. Consumer alignment comes there also mm -hmm. in play uh, with quite some patients. And then, and maybe even considering, although it's rare, that, yeah. that maybe you have to re-intervene on these patients later on. So you want to keep the, the, the door open for possibilities to do that. Uh, for the so redo yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah. So all of these are, are huge issues and, you know, particularly durability really plays into so much of that. And 2023 has been a big year because we've had a lot of data come at us um, in 2023. So Didier, you were a, a co-investigator for yeah. the Evolute Loris trial. So why don't you just give us what the key messages for this trial? Okay, so it's a, you, it's a very important uh, trial. Uh, low risk population, STS score below uh, 3, uh, so 100, 1,400 patients were randomized between STAVI and surgery with the, and TAVI with the Evolute platform. And we have, we have had the four years data presented at TCT. And it's really interesting and it adds to our comprehension of the potential durability of these second generation platforms. So to summarize in that population, what we saw at four years, was a 26% decrease in the hazard of death or disabling stroke uh, in favor of TAVI. So less of this primary endpoint in the TAVI harm as compared to the surgical surgery. The curves start to diverge very early, like one month after the procedure. And they, say, they, stay, they continue to diverge over time. And that's really impressive. So it tells us that in our patients, we can expect to have a very low rate of death or disabling stroke at four years using this type of self-expanding supranular platform. It's superior to surgery in terms of hemodynamics, so less uh, a bioprosthetic valve dysfunction, mainly driven by better hemodynamics, lower uh, mean gradient, uh, few patients with fewer patients with mean gradients above 20, mm -hmm. and uh, less patient prosthesis mismatch. And quite reassuring as well, uh, Ole, uh, is the clinical thrombosis rate, which is equal mm -hmm. in surgery and TAVI, and very low. So the rate of clinical thrombosis it seems to be very minimal with the Evolute platform, and so, that's reassuring. So really good and sustained and even outcomes over time. So. Um, Oli, you were involved in Notion, and we have even longer-term data yep. now from, from this trial. So what, what are our key messages from, from the Notion trial? Yeah, baseline, they're kind of in line with, with the low-risk trial. This, so what is the Notion trial? It's actually a trial which was also low-risk patients, but they were already treated more than 10 years ago, in a period 2009 to 2013, where nobody was talking about treating mm -hmm. low-risk patients. Yeah. So there was a trial in Scandinavia done, and patients enrolled, surgery versus TAVI. What we see at 10 years, because now the 10 years follow-up data, and there's a good number of patients still alive. That's a unique point because most of these patients treated in that period, 2009, 2013, typical mortality is extremely high. So there's no patients that follow up anymore at 10 years. But because these were low-risk patients, there's still 35 to 40 percent of these patients alive mm -hmm. at 10 years. Okay. So that gives a unique data set. First, clinical uh, outcomes, mortality, stroke, uh, myocardial infarction. These curves are actually just on top of each other, surgery versus STAVI, no difference. So, but non-inferior, non completely uh, on top of each other. If we look then to the valve performance, on the other hand, then we see that for, if we look first to structural valve deterioration, 
that we see that there is a tendency of lower structural valve deterioration, 20-25% lower in the TAVI arm versus surgery. There's no statistical significance, but that has, no, has to be a surprise because this study was not powered to have a follow-up of 10, 10 years, so it's just a rather small sample size still, but still it's only 15.4% at 10 years for the TAVI versus 21% for the surgery. And then if we look to the severe structural valve deterioration, which is really clinically important for your patients, I would say, then in the core valve, but this, this was still all done with the core valve platform, in the core valve, this was only 1.5% mm. versus 10% in the surgical arm. So clearly better performing than the surgical valves. And then if you look to uh, the bioprosthetic valve dysfunction, the severe uh, BVD, then we also see that there it's uh, first that encompasses uh, severe SVD, the structural valve deterioration, but it also contains PPM, severe patient prosthesis mismatch, which was also lower, of course, in the TAVI arms versus surgical arms. So that makes that this was also statistically significant difference and better for the TAVI arm versus the, the surgical arm. So very reassuring yeah. uh, up to 10 years. So and would you say, would you say would, uh, could we add the fact that there were less reintervention, equal reintervention, not less, but equal, equal reintervention rate yeah. in the surgical arm and the TAVI arm? And this is reassuring yeah. because all generation uh, TAVI device yes. The sizing methodology, it was eco, if I... It was not even based on CT. Yeah, also yeah it was eco, that's And uh, yeah. TOE, uh, yeah, yeah exactly. sizing. And the same reintervention rate. And this is, uh, when it comes to putting this into perspective with our patients, this is really reassuring, to my opinion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, are all valves the same? Is this, uh -huh. this a, is this a class effect? Is this something, or is this something particular to the, to the platform? So, may I start? Yeah. So, uh, so, so this is a very uh, crucial question. Because, we have to ask it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we have to address yeah. it. You're right. At the end of the day, it comes to uh, tailoring the device to your patient. We know that we've heard that hemodynamics matters because structural valve deterioration, severe structural valve deterioration is going to be associated to a higher mortality and a poorer quality of life for our patients. So depending on the anatomy of the patient, selecting a device that could be, for instance, if we talk about the able platform, self-expanding supranular in small anatomies, for, for instance, could make sense. Uh, so I wouldn't say that there is a class effect for everyone. I think it's more about selecting the proper device for the, for the patient. And we, go, we have to wait for trials like the SMART trial. In the, for instance, it was the mm -hmm. small analyte population, randomization one-to-one, -one, self-expanding supranular Evolute Pro Pro Plus, Again, Sapien Free, Sapien Free Ultra. So we're going to get a very nice data set to uh, provide answers to your question. But it's critical. So yeah. what's your view on no, that? No, I think so. I, I, if I can complement on that, I think, first of all, yeah, you have to really do a patient-tailored choice of the valve to the patient's anatomy. I think that's really what we currently in contemporary practice do and what we should do. But two small things I want to highlight extra, I think, which are really uh, important also a bit, if you look then to specifically Evolute platform, Okay. First of all, the supranal leaflet position gives not only the great hemodynamics, it also protects, I think, against uh, clinical valve thrombosis, which is also uh, maybe yeah. an issue. So that's really, it protects against that. And then secondly, the, the patient prosthesis mismatch, it's always such a vague terminology, is, mm. is this important for your patient, yes or no? I think it's probably, it may have consequences for the long-term durability, but I think even stronger than that, I think it has consequences for the current uh, clinical uh, quality of life for the patient right now because it, it, if you have moderate or severe PPM you, your exercise tolerance will be less and that's yeah. maybe not so important if we treat an octogenarian yeah. but if we start treating indeed these 70 year olds they, they still do cycling or whatever yeah, exactly, they yeah. want to you don't want to limit them in their exercise capacity and I guess that is the, the difficulty with these trials because we see in contemporary practice that the age is moving down and yeah. down and down but do we really have the data to support that in terms of the average age, I think, for the yeah. evolute low risk, yeah, we're, we're still treating an, a, yeah, a more elderly 70, population. 74, you're right. And we, we need to wait for, uh, even in Notion, the average age was uh, 80, close to 80. Right. Exactly, so. this was a low risk trial, but elderly patients. And the important thing that we forget sometimes is if it's all good to, to talk about treating a lot of younger patients, but that means you're treating much more bicuspids. So also that element of evidence, we're still missing a yeah. little bit, I would say. We do it with good results and all that. I mean, honestly, but we, but need to improve. we don't have any long-term durability in, in that specific in terms group. Of and could we say that instead of uh, talking about younger patients, could we uh, talk more about patients with longer life expectancy? Yeah, exactly. Because this is going... 
to That's be really the key issue. That's yeah, maybe yeah. an important point to make here too. We know there's some great Swedish data there. I mean, what is the expected life expectancy of, of your patients? And that's yeah. really was an eye opener to me. If you talk about treating an 80 year old with a severe arctic stenosis sitting in front of you, you are talking about this treatment. He has eight to 10 years lifespan in average left. Yeah. Yeah. If, you to, if you have a 75 year old patient, he has typically around 10 years left. If you have a 70 years old patient in front of you with severe arctic stenosis, he typically has 10 to 12 or 10 to 13 exactly. years yeah. maximum life, life expectancy. So in a way you should almost take a valve that, that he, he doesn't outlive his valve, that the valve outlives the patient. Exactly. <laughs> if you can make a choice like that, that's probably a good, uh, good choice. Okay. That's the way to go for the future. Yeah. So, and speaking of the future, I mean, we've seen iterations of the device and there's mm. the FX device that's coming. So what can we expect from that and how is that going to impact? Uh, yeah, so the FX, what does it bring? So it's, it's been redesigned with a new nose cone for better trackability, uh, one spine instead of two for more flexibility a longer uh, stability layer uh, for accuracy of deployment and these markers for commercial alignment. So, uh, so it's gonna improve the R accuracy during the, the, the procedure to perfectly place the device and align the commissures. Uh, so we are starting our experience in Europe, but based on the uh, US experience, it is an improvement as compared to the Evolute Pro, uh, Pro Plus. So I think it could be a device suited for patients with longer life expectancy. Uh, do you think that this is going to impact the tab in tab because you uh, uh, in yeah. integrated the tab in tab into the equation? Mm. Do you think that this type of device could be yeah. useful? Yeah, I think so. I mean, well, first, I agree with all the points you may named, and I think it makes the precision of your implant just higher. That's what it finally it's results with. But indeed, you bet your question to redo, Tavi. I think the unique thing there is that at least now you see clearly where these commissures are. So that's important not only for index implants of your valve, but also yeah. if you maybe you have to intervene later if you have to do leaflet modification or you have to do a re-implant or a, for coronary cannulation, etc. later on. It's important that at least you know where these, these come exactly. are. So now we have at least a, a clear indication fluoroscopic marker where that is and that can help us in, in optimizing these mm. redo towers in the future. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much for your insights. Um, it's a, a, a lot of uh, data and about great discussion around lifetime management for these patients. Um, we've had some very encouraging results and we're going to follow very closely the results of the Evolute Loris trial. They're going to publish their data yearly yeah. um, from four until ten years. So that's really, really going to give us more information and uh, give us uh, more security. And um, of course, to get our hands on the Evolute FX and, and all that it's going to bring to us too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antoinette. Thank, Thank you. you, Thank you, Antoinette. Thank you, Antoinette.